Hello everyone and welcome to part two of the protocol buffers in the browser tutorial. In this part, we're going to talk about how to actually build a JavaScript file that runs in the browser and uses protocol buffer definitions that we compiled earlier. If you haven't watched the previous video, I recommend doing that before you start this one. I'm here in my protocol buffer web folder and I'm just going to uh, go into the client folder that we created earlier. And here I'm going to uh, create a new index.html file, which will be the web page that the browser displays. Now I'm just going to paste in some HTML I wrote earlier. It's pretty simple. Essentially, I just include a script called bundle.js, which will generate shortly. The body is just a paragraph that says, open the console. For now, all our JavaScript will just print the console, so we're not going to actually write any UI for this part. Now let's create a script. Let's call it uh, client.js. The client will just talk to the server using a WebSocket connection. So let's first create a WebSocket connection uh, to localhost, because we'll run the server on localhost for now. The URI we're going to talk to will be just localhost uh, port 8080. But since uh, we're using a WebSocket connection, we need to prefix this with uh, WS for WebSockets, colon slash slash. Much like you would do for HTTP, but instead we're using WebSockets here. Now, creating a WebSocket is really simple. You can just declare the socket equals a new WebSocket and give it the URI. And that's it. Now, the socket can communicate using binary data, and there are two different types of binary uh, data that the JavaScript library can handle. It can either use binary data in array buffers or in blobs. For our purposes, we have very small messages, so we're going to just set the binary type to array buffer. If you decide to use blobs, uh, things get a little bit more complicated because blobs have a promise-based API, but I won't get into that too much here. Anyway, what this means is that any time we receive data in binary, we'll receive it in an array buffer format. Now we want to know when the socket actually opens, so we can do that using sock.add event listener. And the socket provides several uh, important events. The first one we'll look at is open. So when an open event occurs, we'll write an anonymous function uh, that takes in an event. And for now, let's just print out socket open. Let's also look at some other message types. So we can do the same thing. We can copy this and paste it. And the next message type we'll look at is a message. We get this event anytime the socket receives data. So in this case, we'll say socket uh, message. And the last one we'll look at is close. This happens when the server closes the connection. So we can say socket closed. Now let's actually just test that this uh, works. In the new terminal window, I'm going to go into the server and let's just run the server. Go run main.co. All right, the server is listening. We're going to make a quick change temporarily to the index.html and let's uh, change this to include the client rather than bundle, which doesn't exist yet. And now let's uh, open the index.html in the browser. And if I look at the console, the socket is open. So it's actually connecting to our server. Now if I refresh the page, that'll close the socket. And now you can see that it's failing to connect. And the reason for that is because our server uh, was programmed to uh, error out fatally if the WebSocket closes. So the server exits, and so when we try to reconnect when I refresh the page, the server is dead, so it can't accept the connection. And that's why we get this error message in the console. Okay, let's go back into our client.js. Now we have a simple JavaScript file that opens a connection to the server using a WebSocket. But I need to actually generate the protocol buffer files for JavaScript before I can uh, send the protocol buffer message from the JavaScript files. So let's do that now. Now let's modify the gen.sh script to actually generate the JavaScript files. So I can do that by typing um, dash, dash dash js out equals and let's generate it in client. So we'll just generate the protocol buffer files directly there. Now the JavaScript out, uh, option takes in a few more configuration parameters. In our case, I want to use the common JS import style. So I can do import style equals common JS. And I also want to generate uh, binary serialization and deserialization methods. I'm going to add the binary option, like so. Now let's run the script. And now if I go back into the client and ls, we'll see that it's generated a service pv.javascript file, uh, which uh, basically contains the messages that we want it to contain. If you look at this file carefully, you can also notice that it's using require. Now require is kind of a node a node.js specific construct. It doesn't exist in the vanilla JavaScript that we're trying to use. So what we're going to have to do is use a tool called Browserify. Browserify will essentially package up uh, all your code and Node.js dependencies. In this case, you can see that we'll need the Google protobuf package from Node.js. And it'll compile all the, all the scripts into a simple bundle.js file. We can then require the bundle.js file in our index.html. Uh, there are other options you can use for getting protocol buffers to work in the web. Options include Webpack or the Clojure compiler. And you can Google those on your own, but for this tutorial, I'll use Browserify. Installing Browserify is very simple. You just type npm install g Browserify, and the dash g flag tells it to install it globally, so you can access it from anywhere uh, in your terminal. 
Essentially what it does is it'll look at your uh, NPM dependencies and package up whatever dependencies your application requires. So in this case, I'm going to uh, need to set up the NPM project. I can do that by typing uh, NPM init, and we'll just accept all the defaults. And let's also type npm install uh, google-protobuf. OK, cool. That was installed. Now, I'm going to need to run a command to generate the uh, bundle.js file. But I don't want to have to keep typing this every time. So I'm going to just make a bash script. So let's make a new script called bundle.sh. So in this script, we're just going to cd into the client folder. And then we're going to run browserify. So browserify. Uh, dash o bundle.js. This says to generate the bundle and then save it to a file called bundle.js. You could save this as whatever file you wanted. Just make sure you input the correct file. Now we need to tell it the source files to look at. In this case, that's going to be client.js and service underscore pb.js. Excellent. Now let's uh, give this executable permissions with chmod. And then let's run it. And if we go into our client folder again, you can see that we now have a file called bundle.h. Uh, I'm not sure why I titled it bundle.h. Let's fix that real quick. Bundle.js, and let's uh, run the bundle again. Okay, cd client. Let's remove the bundle.h we had. And you can see that it's generated the bundle.js, so that's great. Now let's look into our index.html file, and we can change this back to bundle.js. Cool. Um, let's open this in the browser again, just to make sure we haven't broken anything. And you can see it's still working. We haven't uh, broken anything. Of course, our WebSocket connection is failing because the server crashed. OK, now we want to actually start using the protocol buffer file. So let's edit our clients.js file. And at the top, let's add in uh, const pd equals require and uh, dot slash service underscore pd. Of course, remember, you can't use require in the browser. But since we're using browserify, what will happen is this script will get compiled by browserify and saved into bundle.js. And if we actually took a look at this, you can see that the code we wrote kind of gets copied into the bundle. So we don't need to require the service pb.js and client.js file in our index.html. We can just include the bundle.js file that browserify generates, and that'll import all of the code we need. So one thing to note is that if you change your code here, it won't get uh, updated in your browser until you rerun the bundle script, because the browser is only looking at bundle.js, not client.js. So just keep that in mind. Every time you make a change here, you'll need to rerun the bundle command. There are some tools that make it easy to watch set of files for changes and rerun uh, browser file automatically whenever you change the file, but I won't uh, use those in this tutorial. Now let's actually write some code to send a request to the server. I'm going to open up the protocol buffer service description that we wrote earlier in the, uh, on the side so we can see if all we're working. And so now let's uh, send a message automatically as soon as the socket opens. Actually, instead of doing that, let's uh, create a separate function called set that takes in a key and a value, and this will send a set request to the server. So let's do that. And then what we can do is we can say let set request equals uh, pb dot set request. Actually, it should be a new pb dot set request. This will just create an empty object, an empty set request object with some default values, and it's up to us to populate that. Uh, so we'll pop in the fields. As you can see, a set request takes in a key, so we can Type set request dot set key to the key, and we can do the same thing for the value. Set request dot set value to value. Remember that when we talk to the server, we have to create this message request object and package our set request inside the one of rep field. Um, that's also simple to do. We can do let request equals new pb dot request like so, and then we can do request dot set set request kind of a mouthful, but uh, set request and the request object we created earlier, like so. Uh, we can also do the same thing for a get request. Let's just copy this and paste. And let's change this to a get, and uh, we don't need a value. Let's change this to get, like so. And the get request contains a key, but no value, so we only need the value. And similarly, here we'll change the set to a get request. So we set the get request field for the request object, again, kind of a mouthful, but uh, hopefully it makes sense. Let's also change this to the get request. Excellent. So now these two methods create uh, empty get request objects and set request objects, but uh, they don't actually send the values anywhere. Now to actually uh, send the request to the server, we want to first convert it into a binary. So it's very simple to do in JavaScript. We can just type uh, data equals request.serialize binary. 
And this will convert our protocol buffer message object into a byte stream. And to send uh, the byte stream along the WebSocket, we can just simply type sock.send data. Like so. And let's also do the same thing for the get request. So data equals request.serialize binary and sock.send data. Like so. Now, once our socket opens, let's uh, send a set request to the server. So we'll type in set uh, foo and let's set it to call, for example. And so now what we expect to happen is we expect to see a socket open message. We'll send the request to the server, and then the server should reply with a response. And so we expect to see the socket message being printed. So let's test that out. Let's save, and let's make sure we rerun the bundle script again. And then if I go to the browser, actually we need to start the server first. So go run main.go, like so. And let's refresh this. And it looks like it's working. We don't actually know what data the server sent us yet, but we know it sent us some message. Let's work on actually being able to read the message that we received. So let's go back into the client and let's open up client.js. Okay, so to deserialize the message, we can do a very similar procedure, but backwards. So to get data out of a message, we can simply do uh, response equals pd dot response dot deserialize binary, and we need to pass in the data that we received. In this case, the data that uh, the WebSocket received is just an event dot data, like so. Let me also open up the protocol buffer files on the side. Excellent. Now we want to check what type of response we, we got, either a set response or a get response. And so the way we can do that is by switching on the type of this one of res field. We can do uh, a case statement. We'll switch on uh, response.get res case. So this will just uh, break out into possible cases based on the type of the res field, either a set response or a get response. Also, this should be a switch, not a case. Now for the actual case statements, it's a little bit uh, funky again, but you can always look at the generated code reference online to see how your uh, one of fields should be used. In this case, I know it's going to be a p dot response dot res case dot uh, set response, and that's how we uh, know that something's a set response. So in this case, let's just say console dot log receive set response and break. And in the other case, we'll have a p dot response dot res case dot get response. And let's do console dot log received uh, get response and then let's break. And we can default to just printing out console dot log received unknown response. So let's uh, actually try this. Again I need to we also need to run the bundle script again, so let's do that. And let me run the server again. Go run main.go. Okay, so it seems like we have a bug in possibly an unsure or not client. I'm going to take a look at that and see what's going on. I'll be right back. All right, after going around, I found that I have a typo here, which would be binary type. Okay, uh, let's try this, and then let's go back here and run the bundle script. Let me also run the server on the side. Okay, and let's refresh. And cool, now we can see it's actually receiving a set response. Now, just to check that things are working, let's also make the plan to do a get on the foo key. That way we can see if the server actually set the foo to bar. So let's go back to the client. Let's open up client.js and let's go down here and uh, we can use the set timeout function to do something a few seconds after we do the set, uh, set request. So let's do set timeout. Uh, let's do a function that just calls get on foo and uh, we'll set it for let's say 2,000 milliseconds. So two seconds after we call set, uh, we should call get on foo. And so let's make sure that we actually print out the response. Uh, so if we get a get response, I want to actually do something with the data. So let's say the get response is equal to response dot get get response, like so. And let's print out uh, key. Let's say um, let's say get response dot get uh, key. We we'll print out an equal sign and let's print out the value get res dot get value. Okay, let's uh, close that and let's run the bundle script. Let's restart the server. And if I refresh, we've received the set response. Now, now we've received the get response two seconds later and we get foo equals bar. So this confirms uh, at least at the surface level that things are working. All right, so that's it for this episode. You've seen how to serialize a protocol buffer object in JavaScript, send it along the WebSocket, receive data back from the WebSocket, and deserialize the message. 
and then be able to read data from the message. In the next episode, we'll polish this example up. We'll add a small user interface that allows us to send uh, set and get requests. And then uh, that'll wrap that up for this series.